Please be seated. My father was a man of peace. He was also a poet and a farmer. At 17, he left the farm in North Louisiana where he had grown up to seek his fortune and eventually became a college professor. He would never live on the old family place again, but in his heart of hearts, my father remained a farmer. I know this because he always had a garden. Depending on the size of the city lot where we happened to live, the garden might consist of a few rows of corn, tomatoes and cucumbers, maybe some butter beans, and always squash, which grew like crazy, producing so lavishly that we got sick of it. One of my earliest memories I must have been no more than three, is of my dad pulling me in a red wagon, which I shared with armloads of fresh corn down the sidewalk of our neighborhood. We would stop at every house so he could give a few of those ears of corn away. The recipients were predictably delighted, but their delight could not come even close to my father's pleasure in the giving of it. His had been a poor family and the farm a poor farm. There was never much money, but there was always, at least in my childish memory, plenty of food. My memories are no doubt idealized, for I didn't see the backbreaking, sometimes heartbreaking toil involved in producing almost everything the family needed to live. Those of you who are younger than I will think I'm making it up when I tell you that my grandmother actually made butter in a wooden churn from the cream she skimmed from the milk of a real live cow she milked herself. That butter tasted different from the city butter I was used to, but as it melted on a biscuit right out of the oven, I can tell you it was just heaven. Top it off with jelly made from the wild grapes my grandmother sent us kids out to hunt for and gather. Well, I can almost swoon just thinking about it. The land is still there, of course, but no one farms on it much anymore. First the paper mills came, and then the natural gas companies, and most of the young people moved away. The way of life I remember so fondly is gone now, and the reasons for that are both simple and complex. I can't know if it has been for good or ill. What I do know is that those rugged, struggling farmers made a good life. Today's gospel lesson, The Feeding of the 5,000, is among the most familiar stories of the New Testament. It's recorded in all four of the gospels, the only miracle given such privileged attention. So we know from the get-go that this is a story we should pay attention to. But why? Was it the miracle of creating loaves and fishes mysteriously out of nothing? Or was it the easier to swallow wonder of people sharing so that everyone had enough? Some scholars suggest that there was no actual event at all, just an invented story to exemplify the parables that precede, that precede it, a prototype, if you will, for this is what can happen when you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Maybe its significance is in the foreshadowing of the Eucharist that we celebrate every Sunday. Jesus taking the bread and blessing it and then giving it away until all are fed. There's no way to know what, if anything, 
quote, really happened on that Galilean hillside. But whatever else we might conclude, it is clear to me that the crowds who follow Jesus everywhere he goes are hungry. Harassed and helpless are the words Matthew uses to describe them back in chapter 9. They are these crowds of people, these multitudes. They are the poor, the ones with no power to change the political, social, economic structures that keep them at the bottom of the heap. They are hungry, at least in part, because they are subject to Roman authority, whereby access to resources, including the land that grows their food, is tightly controlled. In other words, the point I'm trying to make is that the context of this story matters, and it matters a lot. The part of this lesson that I'm most curious about and have never even noticed before is verse 13, the first part of which is chopped off and we did not hear it in the reading, but it goes like this. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. This seems on the surface to have nothing whatsoever to do with the drama that is about to unfold. But going back to the first half of chapter 14, Jesus' withdrawal makes perfect sense. And it sheds new light on this story, at least for me. We rarely hear the bizarre tale of King Herod's extravagant birthday party ending up in the terrifying beheading of John the Baptist. But that is the news that Jesus heard. That is the shock that moved him to go off by himself away from the crowds, away even from his closest friends. Can we try for a moment to even imagine the depth of Jesus' distress? Was there, along with what must have been anguished grief, anger at Herod's senseless cruelty? Is it possible that Jesus despaired at the sheer enormity of the injustices that defined his time? And could even Jesus have experienced just a twinge of fear as he considered the implications of Herod's madness? The text is frustratingly silent. But we do know, if not what Jesus felt, what Jesus did and what he didn't do. He did not, for example, stir up his disciples to go avenge John's death. Nor was he paralyzed by whatever heavy-heartedness he may have felt. Rather, he withdrew, perhaps to pray, perhaps to listen for the voice of the one he called Father, perhaps to regroup, to prepare himself to continue the work that he had come to do. Wendell Berry has long been one of my spiritual mentors. He is an activist and a poet, the author of over 40 books, and a professed Christian. Mostly, though, Berry calls himself a farmer, passionate about the just and proper use of the land, which he sees as a gift of God given for the flourishing of all of us. Another way to put it is is to say that when a man or a woman can no longer make a living off the land, when food systems are more for profit than for feeding people, we are in very deep trouble as a society. Now in his 80s, Barry has become downright contrary about what he sees as the utter indifference of the powerful 
toward those who suffer, among other things, food insecurity. What I am trying to suggest, brothers and sisters, is that seen through a justice-seeking lens, today's gospel becomes more than a miracle story, more than a call to generosity or an invitation to, a, to adopt an abundance worldview. It becomes not a story at all, but a protest, a protest of the contrast between Herod's lavish banquet for a few and the hunger of multitudes on a hillside. Between Caesar's kingdom and God's heavenly kingdom, where all are fed and satisfied. Jesus came not only to announce, but to make manifest that kingdom. And then, when all the people are fed and the baskets of leftovers are gathered, can you imagine what Jesus did then? He went up the mountain by himself to pray. That will be in next week's reading. Why? Because justice work is not for the faint of heart. The strength and patience to resist the way things are for the sake of what could be must be cultivated intentionally and continually. How does one do that? Wendell Berry does it by getting his hands in the dirt and by writing prayers that are poems. One called The Peace of Wild Things is particularly apropos for those, of, for those of us who want to do this work. Listen. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. I imagine that something like that is what Jesus did when he went off by himself. I believe, that what, I believe that Jesus was able to do what he did because he found ways to rest in the grace of the world. As Christians, we too are called to rest in that grace. My father, I believe, was resting in grace as he gave away the corn he toiled over in his neighborhood. We will each discover our own ways of resting in grace and then become a source of grace for others. In just a few moments, we will hold out our hands to accept the bread of heaven. Eat the bread. Become that bread. Be that bread for the world. Amen.